Jesus in the Passover, the Garden of Gethsemane, and there's a place in the garden where Jesus cries out to God because he realizes what God's will is for him. He knows what God's will is for him, and he did not want to do it. But ultimately, Jesus did what he was called to do, and that's to take on the sins of mankind. But what if he said, you know what, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do God's will. I have a greater dream. Then all of us would be facing hell right now. But Jesus would fulfill what God had for him. You have dreams. Give those dreams to God and let him fulfill those dreams for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that your word gives us principles to live by. I thank you that we can learn about the life of Jesus and Jesus is the example for us. Help us, Lord, to learn some things as we look over what took place that took place before the Passover feast, what took place at that what they call the Last Supper, what took place in the garden. Help us to learn some things that we can apply in our own life. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> What we're going to look at is first off of John chapter 13, verses 2 to 5. We're going to look at before the Passover takes place, before the Last Supper takes place, before Jesus is having his last meal with the disciples. There's an event that took place. It's a powerful event that shows the character of Jesus Christ. And, and so we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to learn something from it, and then we're going to try to apply it to our own life. Then we're going to look what was taking place at the Passover itself. And then we're going to take a look at what happened at the Garden of Gethsemane. And I, there we go. Okay, so John chapter 13, verses 2 to 5, it says, During supper the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things to his hands, and that he had come forth from God, and was going back to God, got up from the supper, and laid aside his garments, and take a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and then wiped them with the towel which he was girded. So here's the story. It is going to be the last time Jesus is with the disciples. They're having what's the Passover. This was the time of the Passover. They're having a meal. And it's interesting. It says he got up from the supper. So we don't know. Every version has a little different version. So they were already at the table. Other versions have it that it was before. It's immaterial when it happened. It's what happened that took place. He got up from the supper. How many know before they had the supper? Anybody ever had supper? What do you do before you eat? What do you do before that? What do you do before that? Don't you talk with each other? You greet each other. You say, hey, how's it going? How was your day? Right? There's some fellowship going on. So most likely what happened here, they're not even started the meal yet, meal yet. They're just having fellowship. They're sitting down. If you know the customs, what do they do? The tables are low. They would kind of nail on their side. They'd kind of be in a real relaxed setting. They're in a relaxed setting. And then all of a sudden, Jesus gives up from there. He takes his garments off. It doesn't say he took all his clothes off. In other words, he's taken off the extra clothes. He takes them off. He takes a towel, and he girded himself. He takes a towel, and he pretty much puts it in his waist. And he has the towel there. And, I, and by then, they're starting to wonder what's going on. Don't you think they're starting to wonder what's going on? What is Jesus doing? And it becomes obvious what he's going to do. He's, he's going to wash the disciples' feet. So it says, Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and then wiped them with the towel which he was girded. Okay, how many of you have been in a foot washing ceremony? Anybody here been in a foot washing ceremony? We've had a few that have been here in a foot washing ceremony. If you know me... I would like us to do foot washing ceremonies. And the number one reason I don't do it, because I don't want it that most people won't show up. Because if we was to do a foot washing ceremony, someone heard about someone and show up. Okay, it's not, you're not used to that. It's not part of our culture. But when they're washing their feet there, listen, anybody coming here, if we wash each other's feet, most likely, especially if you know there's going to be a foot washing ceremony, what are you going to do before it ever happens? You're going to wash your feet. You're going to trim your toes. The ladies are probably going to, to uh, get a pedicure on their toes. Make sure their toes look good, that everything looks pretty. Okay, and it's going to look really nice because you're going to wash my feet. Do you think that's what happened here? So they weren't prepared for Jesus to wash their feet. So when he went to wash their feet, somebody's probably saying, Oh, my goodness. I should have washed my feet before I came in. So the whole point is when Jesus washed their feet, are their feet going to be dirty? They're going to be dirty. They wore what? 
They wore sandals. Anybody wear sandals? Some of you put socks on when you wear sandals so your feet don't get dirty. They didn't wear socks on their feet when they put their sandals. So they got dirty feet. So they have dirty feet, and Jesus is going to wash their feet. And I bet they're saying, oh, no, 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 this can't happen. Only one of them is bold enough to say something. Peter ends up saying something. The rest of them don't say anything. Only Peter is bold enough to say something. But Jesus washes their feet. In order to wash their feet, what does he have to do? He has to do what? He has to kneel to get down to their feet. King of kings, Lord of lords, does what? Bows before man. Any example there? It says in Philippians to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ, and it talks about the mind of Christ was, is to have humbleness. So Jesus kneels down to start washing their feet. As he washes their feet, all of a sudden there's one character that is going to get his feet washed. And that one character that's going to get his feet washed, who is he? Anybody know who he might be? And I call him a character. He is a character in the plot. Who is it? Judas. Judas is going to wash his feet. What does it say? It says in verse 3, or verse 2, verse 2. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus knowing that all things are in the Father's hands. That means Jesus knew that Judas was going to, at that point, he knew Judas was going to betray him. And he turns around and kneels and washes uh, Judas' feet. Have you ever been betrayed by anybody? Anybody backstab you? Anybody done something wrong to you? Have they? Will you say hi and shake their hand? Most of us want to say hi and shake their hand. Jesus is washing their feet. What would happen if some of you had somebody that's backstabbed you? And you saw them. You saw them at the bus stop. You saw them at the post office. You saw them someplace. And you saw them. And they're an enemy of yours. They've done something that's harmed you. There's one thing when somebody don't like somebody, it's something else when they've harmed you. They've harmed you. And it's right over here. You're right at the bus stop over here. And you see them and you say, hey, do you have a few minutes? And they're wondering why you want a few minutes with them. Probably to chew them out because they did something to you. Do you have a few minutes? And they say, well, why? Hey, just trust me. And you take them and says, come over to the church. And you turn around and you get a bucket of water. And you get a towel. And it says, I just wanted to wash your feet. Now, how many of you would do that with your enemy? How many would do that with your friend? <laughs> okay? You want to do it with a friend, you won't wash their feet. But if you did that with your enemy, what would change? What do you think would happen? Now, I could tell you what we'd want to happen. What would you think? You think maybe they'd see you in a different light? You think maybe they would respect you all of a sudden? That's what you would hope. But did Judas do that? Jesus washed the feet of Judas. Did that soften his heart? No. He still went out and, and, and betrayed Jesus. So I'm not saying that the foot washing would change that person's heart at all. But I can tell you it would mess up their head for a long time. Wouldn't it? But how many of you would ever do that? Well, okay, I don't want to wash their feet. Just buy them lunch instead. Buy them a gift instead. Just play with their head to get them really to look at, oh, I don't understand, why would this person do that? And as you're washing their feet, you say, you know why I'm washing your feet is because Jesus is my example. He washed the feet of an enemy. And he's my example. So I want to humble myself and wash your feet. Now, of course, literally, that's probably never going to happen. But what would happen if every believer in Christ followed that kind of principle? What do you think would happen? You think maybe society would change a little bit? You think maybe there'd be a different environment that'd be going on? And the reality, none of us have had what, what Judas did to Jesus. Has anybody had a, got a, somebody that they paid to, a hitman to kill you? At least you don't know about it. You're still alive, so whoever they paid kept the money. They didn't actually come and kill you. Most of us have never had that kind of an enemy. And yet Jesus did it. So how much could we do to reach out to somebody that's an enemy? Now we're going to go to Luke 22, 14 and 22. So Jesus washes their feet. Now we're talking about, they're, now they're at the, the Passover table. Verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the, when the hour had come. In other words, right at the right moment. When it was time. There's a time and a season for everything. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Right there, what is he saying to them? Hey guys, there's going to be some suffering going on. 
I want to eat this before I suffer. For I say unto you, I shall never eat again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I will never eat again with you. What should the disciples know at that point in time? What should they know? Jesus isn't going to be around. He's not going to be around. He's going to go away. Something's going to happen to him. At this point, they, he's told him before that he's going to be killed. They don't believe him. He's telling them again. He's preparing them, letting them know. And it says, I say to you, I'll never eat again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now listen, it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. People think until I go to heaven. That's not what it's saying. Until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Until what's fulfilled? What are you supposed to do? What was he supposed to do? Take on the sins of mankind. Die on the cross. Resurrect. Because we know that Jesus ate after he's resurrected. Before he went to heaven, he ate. Because he ate with them when he made the, cooked up the fish on the shore for them. After he'd been resurrected. But he says, I'm not going to eat with you again until the, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Verse 17. And when he takes a cup and gives thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. Now when Jesus takes that cup, what is it symbolic of? When we take communion, what is it symbolic of? The blood of Jesus. So when he takes that cup, he, he, that, that is his blood. It's as if it's his blood that's going to be poured out. And he says, partake of this. Does anybody know there was blood when it came to Passover time? What was the blood that was during Passover time? It was the what? The unblemished lamb, the Passover lamb. Its blood was shed for what? It's to protect the Israelites from what? The death angel. So as to protect them from death. And so out of it, when Jesus takes of that cup that's representing his blood that's being shed, it was symbolic of the shed blood of the Passover lamb that was to protect the people, the Israelites, from death. Is, does Jesus' shed blood protect us from death? It protects us from what death? What? Spiritual death. The second death. So Jesus' blood protects us from the eternal death that is to come for those who don't know Christ. Verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So the body. What happened to the lamb? The lamb was killed. Its body was killed. It was, the lamb was, was slaughtered. Was Jesus slaughtered? Was Jesus killed? Yes. He was the Passover lamb. So it was, again, symbolic. And it says, the same way he took the cup after eating, saying, this cup is part of you in the covenant of my blood. Verse 21, but behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with, is with mine on the table. 21, but behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. You know what he's saying? One of you is going to betray me. And you're with me as I do communion with you. There's a principle there. Jesus did communion with a enemy. What about you? Will you do commune with an enemy? And he says, is the person who's betraying me is with mine on the table. His hand is with mine. And it's interesting, the disciples still didn't know who it was. And this shows how messed up they were. If you know the story, it doesn't say it here, but guess what? They start asking, Lord, am I the one that's going to betray you? Isn't that interesting? They're saying, God, am I the one that's going to betray you? I would say some of you would ask the same question because some of you don't have a close intimate relationship with Christ. If you have a close intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not questioning if you're going to betray him. But if you're in a wishy-washy kind of a backslidden state with God, you're not working, you're not serving God with all your heart, you're kind of this in-between state, then probably you're asking yourself, if Jesus returns, I'm running if I'm going to get to heaven or not. That's a dangerous place to be in life. It was a dangerous place for the disciples to be that Jesus says, one of you are going to betray me. And they're saying to each other, is, is it you? Is it me? That's messed up. Something's wrong. They spent three and a half years with Jesus. And they don't even know what the relationship is with them. What about you? Verse 22. For indeed the Son of Man is going to have been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. It says that the Son of Man, that's Jesus talking about himself, it is going to, what has been determined is for him to be betrayed, for him to die on the cross, for him to raise from the grave. And he says what? He says, woe to the man that's going to betray me. So when he says, woe to the man that's going to betray me, what should have Judas thought? I better get right with God. 
He says, woe to the man that betrays me. Woe means there's going to be a problem that comes. Something's going to happen. Disaster is going to happen. Tragedy is going to happen. He's saying, whoever's going to betray me, tragedy is going to happen. And then, if you look at another passage about the story, then he says to Judas, go do what you got to do. And you know what Judas should have said? No, Lord, forgive me. No way am I going to betray you. Please forgive me. But what does Judas do? He goes and betrays him. When somebody hardens their heart, there is no way out. There comes a place when your heart is so hard, your heart is so cold, you're so determined to obey the devil, there's no way out. There's no way of escape. There is no room for repentance. There came a place where that Judas could no longer repent. It was impossible to repent. That is a dangerous, dangerous path to go down. That you continue to harden your heart. You continue to harden your heart. You continue to harden your heart. You continue to reject the Spirit of God to a point that there is nothing that can be done but you to go down a path of destruction. What we're going to do before we go to another passage of Scripture, since we talked about communion, we're going to go ahead and have communion. So, so far what we've done is we've looked at the foot washing that took place. We've seen that Jesus... Turn around and wash the disciples' feet. That he humbled himself before them. That Jesus turned around and talks about that he is the sacrificial lamb. He's the Passover lamb. I don't know if you've... How many have ever participated in um, Passover, a Jewish Passover? Anybody participate in it? And all the symbolism that's in it? Uh, I am sure there's probably be a church in the area that's going to do that. Uh, I will check and see who might be having it. But I encourage you to participate and see the, how the Passover service actually takes place. There's a lot of different things. That, the symbolism is unbelievable. I, I have Jewish friends, and, and there are times I've had it I tell them, I know that you believe in the Passover. And so I said, let's look at it. And so we look at all the elements of the Passover. We look at all that takes place. And then we turn around and tell them, now look at the story of Jesus. Don't it seem similar to you? Don't it seem like it's the same thing that's happening? One of the interesting things, they take the item, I forget what it is, but they take it and they hide it from the children. And the children have to find it. So I don't remember, it's a certain food item. And they have to find it. Isn't that interesting? Guess what? Doesn't that symbolic of Jesus hidden in the grave? And then they come to the tomb to what? To find him, and can they find him? No. Isn't that interesting? The, the story of Jesus just follows the Passover completely. Okay, we need to go to Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 46. And he came out and proceeded as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. Where the Mount of Olives was, was the Garden of Gethsemane. So it says, he went out to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. Verse 40, when he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus tells them, we're going to go here. He's already told them he's going to die. They still don't understand all that's going on. But Jesus says, hey, I'm going to be suffering pretty soon. There's going to be a death taking place that everything he was doing, he, I'm sure he was talking to them, and he's talking about the Passover lamb, and, and he He's giving them all the hints that, hey, I'm going to be the Passover lamb. And he says to them, I, I want you to not to pray so you don't enter in temptation. Anybody know what they did? What did they do? They slept. Anybody ever do that? Lord, help me not to, not to get into this mess I'm getting into. Lord, I'm just going to pray. And all of a sudden, you may not sleep physically, but all of a sudden you forget everything you was praying about and you, enter, and you go right into the thing that you're being tempted by. Verse 41, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. God, if it's willing, will you take this, what I'm supposed to do, will you take this away from me? Will you take this, this calling that's in my life? Listen, was Jesus called to be whipped and beaten? Was Jesus called to take our sins? Was Jesus called by God to die on the cross? Was Jesus called by God to be buried? Was Jesus called by God to be resurrected? Was that not his calling in life? Was that not what Jesus was meant to do? Absolutely. But what does he say? Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Take away what I am supposed to do. If it's your will, God, take it away from me. How many know he probably was going through some trials? How many know he was probably being tormented? Some things are going on. You ever gone through trials? You ever been tormented? You ever said, God, I don't want to do your will? 
It's okay to say that. If it was okay for Jesus to say, God, is there another way out? It's okay for us to say, God, is there another way out? But what do we have to do after we say that? But if it's your will, God, I'll do exactly what you have for me to do. God, I committed a crime, and I've been convicted, and i got to go to prison. I'm supposed to go for 20 years. God, can you make it two years? Is it okay to pray that? If you don't pray it, it will be 20 years. But if you pray, God, I repented. Lord, you know, I repented. As soon as I did it, I repented. Lord, I ask that you make the 20 years two years. It's okay to pray that. But, Lord, if you have for me to serve 20 years because there's a purpose for it, Lord, I do it. Now, most of us don't have that kind of extremeness that we have to deal with. But what is it? Lord, if this relationship is meant not to be, take it away from me. Lord, if this job is not what I'm supposed to have, Lord, take it away from me. Lord, if that house that I want that's over right, it's right over there on 1st Avenue and 128th, and I really want it, that's my dream house. But if it isn't your will, Lord, take it away. Is that the kind of heart we have? Or do we say, I want it and I'm going to get it no matter what? Or do we say, I'm not going to do it no matter what? You see, either way is wrong. If either way we're trying to get outside the will of God, it's wrong. What did Jesus say? He says, Father, if you want to remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Is that your heart? God, I'm going to do your will. Whatever it is, I'm going to do it. Whatever it is, I'm going to do it. Verse 43, now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Now, why did the angel have to strengthen Jesus? He's Jesus. He's God. He's God and he's man. He's both. He's both. And the man side, the flesh side, the non-God side needs strengthening. So what happens? An angel from heaven appears to him and strengthens him. So if an angel from heaven strengthens, can God send people, angels, your way to strengthen you? So here's what we want. Listen. It, 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 just look what it says. It says that Jesus is asking God, is there any way not to do this? But God may, if it's your will, then let it be done. And then he's strengthened. You know what we want? God to send the angel first. And then we'll decide if we do his will. God, you make me feel good. And if you make me feel good, then I'll do your will. But that's not how it happened. He says, I'll do your will, and then God strengthens him. Too many of us want God, God, just make me feel good, and I'll do your will. God, just do this, and I'll serve you. God, give me a good wife, and I'll serve you. God, give me, what is it, a good job. Give me a job at Microsoft, and I'll serve you. What if you're not supposed to have a job at Microsoft? So then you won't serve him? And so I, we should have the heart of Jesus. God, I'm going to do your will. And in the midst of it, it may be hard. It may be troublesome to do it. It may be tough to do it. But then if you do God's will, he'll do what? He will strengthen you. In verse 44, Now being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Now this is messed up. Verse 43, God sends an angel to strengthen them. Verse 44, he's in agony. Wait a second. I thought the angel was there to strengthen him. Why is he in agony? How many know that God can strengthen you, God can do all that he can do for you, but you still have to live on this earth and still have to face some troubles. So God, I don't want to go to my boss and tell him that I stole the narcotics. Give me strength. And God sends somebody to you and they encourage you and say, you know what, you can do it. You can go to that boss and, and let him know that you stole those narcotics. It's going to cost you your job. You may go to jail for it. But God will give you the strength to do what is right. And they encourage you. But what do you got to still do? You got to go to the boss and tell him you stole the narcotics. Can you still be in agony? Yes. What's the point? Is that God will give us strength, but we don't live by feeling. So God, if you give me strength, you give me encouragement, I'll do what you say. But if you don't, I won't. And then God gives you strength, and then you still have to deal with what you've got to do, and you won't do it. There has to be a place when we're going through what we're going through that we make a decision. I am going to serve Jesus with all my heart. I'm going to honor God with my heart. I made a decision that I decided to follow Jesus. When I decided to follow Jesus, I meant it. And that meant I was going to follow Jesus no matter what happens. Jesus and the Father in eternity past made a decision that Jesus would be the sacrifice and Jesus fulfilled being that sacrifice. Praise God that Jesus didn't go by feelings. Praise God that Jesus did what he was called to do. Jesus did it fully as man, fully God. 
Jesus had no sin in him whatsoever. Jesus was fully God. But at the same time, he was a man. He was a human being. And when he went to that cross, he went to the, human, the cross as a human being. When he went to the, the false trial, when he got whipped, when he got beaten, all that he went through, he did it as a human being, experienced what a human being would experience. He was faithful to the end. Are you faithful to the end? This is Preacher Rich D. Creating Futures committed to equipping individuals and churches to fulfill the Great Commission, which is the lead of individuals to Christ as their Lord and Savior, so that they may have eternal life, and discipling them so that they may become devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Give us a call at 1-866-WANT-GOD. That is 1-866-WANT-GOD. If you like this video, please click on the link below and subscribe to our Creating Futures channel. To learn about going to heaven, click on the attached video or go to creatingfutures.org. That is creatingfutures.org.